um, almost all maps, 99% or more of all maps, are intended primarily to communicate geographic information. We're here to talk about the other 1%. Uh, persuasive cartography. Maps intended primarily not to communicate geographic information, but to influence opinions or beliefs. Now, there's a threshold question, uh, uh, particularly here at the Warburg Institute. Why maps? I mean, after all, the Warburg is world famous for its focus on the cultural significance of icons of all kinds. So, uh, why not persuasive paintings or persuasive sculpture, or persuasive prints or posters or photographs? Uh, are maps special among visual images? And for me, the answer to that question is yes. It starts when we're very young. I think almost all of us have a recollection from the time when we were very young of getting in a car with a parent and watching the parent open a road map or today it would be a GIS uh, uh, op, op, app, uh, and follow that roadmap in order to drive the car someplace we've never been before. The parent trusts the map. When we go to school and the teacher introduces a new subject, what's the first thing the teacher does? The teacher shows us a wall map, whether it's ancient Greece or our own country. The teacher trusts the map. And this is not a new phenomenon. The image I'm showing now is a plate from a Dutch emblem book published 300 years ago. This particular emblem book contains uh, a series of sections, each one uh, related to a particular biblical passage. And in this case, the author is talking about the passage in which Jesus says, I am the way the truth, and the light. And the author has chosen to illustrate that passage with a picture of a map maker. There he is. He's sitting at his workbench. He has his tools of his trade in his hand. He's working on a map. There's another map uh, on the uh, easel behind him. And the title is, Thus Men Go Safely. You can trust the map to go safely. The map will show you the truth. I suggest to you that maps are uniquely persuasive among uh, visual images because they are uniquely presumed to be true. Now, the consequence of that is if you're trying to influence someone uh, and if you can find a, a way, a, a sensible way to meaningfully incorporate a map in your persuasive effort, you stand to gain some uh, level of marginal advantage. It may be a small advantage, it may be a large advantage, but the map will give you a little help because people uniquely presume them to be true. And one piece of evidence for this proposition is the fact that persuasive maps have been used to influence opinions on almost every subject you can think of, <laughs> national or domestic, um, uh, uh, military or governmental, religious or moral, uh, cultural, social, and commercial. And this list here, this is just a partial list of the subjects represented in my collection. I'm going to show you examples of some of those today. Um, but I want to focus the talk today not on the subject of persuasive cartography, but of the tools of the persuasive map maker. And this is a partial list, I don't by any means want to suggest it's complete, of the tools, the techniques, the tricks available uh, to the persuasive map maker. Um, and uh, I want to point out something about this list uh, as you look at it. Uh, if you think about the traditional cartographer at work on a traditional map, some of these terms are quite familiar, the use of color, the use of symbols, at least simple symbols, the use of text or lettering. But most of these 
categories. Most of these techniques are not the techniques of the map maker. They're the techniques of the artist. Allegory, satire, the use of dramatic symbols, the extensive use of text, selectivity, selective inclusion or exclusion, perspective, style, deception. These uh, are the tools uh, of artists. And one other thing I want to note as we look at this list, if you're trying to make a map to influence someone, you're very likely not to use just one of these techniques. You're likely to use two or three or perhaps even four um, in the same map. So let's start with an example. This is an image from the women's suffrage movement in the United States, 1915. Um, the, the most dramatic part of this is this huge symbol of freedom, of liberty, of enlightenment, and that is the Statue of Liberty, Lady Liberty. Her torch is held aloft. The Western states of the United States uh, had mostly adopted at least some form of suffrage. Not all of them had adopted complete suffrage, but they'd adopt some form of suffrage. The, none of the, East, the Eastern states uh, had not completely adopted suffrage, at least not full suffrage. Some of them had partially suffrage, partial suffrage. The artist here vastly oversimplifies the map. Lady Liberty's torch has brought light, enlightenment, to the Western states. They, have, they all shine in the bright light. The East is in the dark. And Lady Liberty is, is moving East. She's pointing East. She's striding East. And the women of the East are stretching out toward the light. They're in the black. They're in the dark. They have not yet been enlightened. And so they are yearning, stretching out their hands toward the light. Here we have three techniques of the persuasive uh, cartographer. Selectivity, or what in this case I would call artistic license. I have my micro uh, headphones on. Symbolism uh, and color. So let's look at another example. Uh, this is from the Russo-Japanese War in 1904, um, and, and this is uh, an, an, a, a satirical map. Satirical mapping is one of the basic tools of persuasive cartography. Again, we see a powerful symbol, the octopus. The octopus is well known to map people. It's found a lot in maps of international conflict, satirical maps of international conflict. It's also used uh, in maps of re showing religious bias, uh, maps attacking cartels, and for I have a number of examples in, in my collection. Again, the color black. The octopus comes from deep uh, in the ocean. Uh, mysterious, dark, unknown. And um, I also want to call your attention to the fact that there's another element of persuasive cartography here that's not quite so obvious. This is a map uh, produced by a Japanese mapmaker, published in Tokyo, concerning a war between Russia and Japan. As you would expect, virtually all of the text is in Japanese, but not all of it. In the upper left-hand corner, we have a legend that's entirely in English, and it's a long legend. I'm not going to read it all. But the thrust of this legend in English is the black octopus is very bad, but not to worry because the further existence of the black octopus is going to depend entirely on how he comes out of this war, and the Japanese fleet has already practically annihilated Russia's naval power in the Orient. Why is this, why is this text in English? While this map was published in Japan, it was widely distributed in Britain. It's 1904. Britain had the most powerful naval force in the world. Britain had decided to remain neutral and to stay out of the war. The Japanese were of the view that if they could keep the major naval forces out of the war, they would be able to defeat the Russians. We don't know uh, what part uh, this map may or may not have played in that decision, but the major naval forces, Britain and others, stayed out of the war, and the Japanese were, of course, successful. Here we have an example of four techniques of persuasive cartography. 
um, the, the use of satire, the use of symbolism, the use of color, and the use of text, all in one map. Now, we've been talking about color, and we've talked about the color of black, which is often used in uh, persuasive cartography. Um, but a, a much more commonly used color is the color red. Uh, this map uses both. William Steed was a muckraking British journalist. He went to Chicago in 1894 for the World's Fair, and he was appalled at the level of crime, of corruption, sin, and immorality in Chicago. And he published a best-selling book called If Christ Came to Chicago, best-selling in both in uh, Britain and the United States. There's only one map in this book. This is the only map in the book. And it's a map of just two square blocks of the city of Chicago with every saloon shown in black and every brothel shown in red. So a very powerful use of the color black and particularly the color red. Here's another example. 1984, the United States Navy was talking about basing some nuclear warships near uh, the city of New York. And the Riverside Church in New York had a disarmament program. They were very much against these nuclear warships. And they published this large poster. If you look, it looks very much as if someone has taken a paintbrush and just thrown a, a, a swatch of red paint uh, across a map of the New York metropolitan area. I want you to notice something in particular about this map, in addition to the color red. You recall that map of woman's suffrage in which the cartographer painted the entire Western United States white, left out all the detail in order to make his message more powerful. Here, the cartographer did exactly the opposite. Every little town and city, the tiniest little towns in the New York metropolitan area are each separately identified and named. Why, why did he do that? He did that because he was hoping that people would come up to this poster, look at it, and find their little town, find exactly where they lived, and notice how close they were to the potential danger caused by this possible nuclear accident. Again, powerful use of the color red. This is a British example from World War I, very widely circulated in different forms. What Germany wants, all of Germany's claims in red. Let me call your attention again to something less obvious about this map. Look at the legend in the upper right-hand corner. That legend doesn't need to be nearly so big. And it didn't have to be there. It could be smaller, it could be at the bottom of the map, it could be in the lower right, it could be in a lot of places. The map maker put that legend there because it covers up a part of the world as to which Germany had asserted no claims. And therefore, the map maker was able to increase the ratio of red to white on the map. By increasing the ratio of red to white, the map maker increased the apparent aggressiveness of German claims. Uh, now, the, the British weren't the only ones uh, using persuasive cartography in World War I. Uh, in 1918, the Germans launched an offensive in France that was quite disastrous. They had almost a quarter of a million casualties, much unhappiness among the German public about the tremendous amount of loss. So the German government published this poster. And the text describes this huge red area as the destroyed territory, widespread collections of ruins, formerly flowering cities and villages, dead industrial plants, fields riven with iron, a total disaster of an area. And in boldface, the text says, we should thank our boys because by fighting in France, they're protecting your, you and your homes from the same fate that would be befalling you otherwise in Germany. Another example of the use of red. So by now, I, I, I think we, we should understand that when we see the color red, a, a lot of the color red on a map, we ought to think that it's something bad. It's something to be feared, something evil. Now, at this point, if we uh, were in a live lecture hall, 
and we weren't all muted, I hope I would have gotten at least a couple of small chuckles. Because of course, red is the color traditionally used to mark out the British Empire in uh, British maps uh, of the 19th and early 20th centuries. What you're looking at here is a famous map of the empire published by something called the Navy League. What is the Navy League? Navy League is a lobbying organization. Organizations set up to convince the public and therefore the parliament to build more ships. It was made up of retired admirals and generals and statesmen, but more importantly, of bankers and industrialists and shipbuilders and steelmakers. And its principal tool, the principal tool of the Navy League was this wonderful map. It's a wall map, it's very large. And the Navy League's view was no school in Britain was properly equipped if it didn't have this map hanging on the wall with an easy view of the scholars. And as we can see, it's a map of the empire. It's surrounded by a huge amount of text describing the history of glories of the British Navy, why it's so important, great deal of textual information. If we take a closer look at this map, we strip away the text, we see it's a classic map of the British Empire. It's on the Mercator projection. We'll talk about that in a minute. But I want to call your attention to something odd on this map. What is that red thing off the coast of Greenland? What, what is that? If we looked more closely, we would see that simply is an inset map of Southeast England and the British Channel. But the young scholars in their classrooms didn't need another map of the English Channel. I think it's probable that that map, that red map, inset map is there uh, for the same reason as the legend on the German map we saw earlier. It increases the ratio of the color red to all the other colors on the map. And therefore, it increases the relative apparent size of the British Empire. But the empire had a, 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 an even easier uh, uh, trick uh, available to it, and that's the Mercator projection. And as the map people well know, uh, the Mercator projection distorts the relative sizes of continents and countries depending on their location on the globe. Uh, continents and countries closest to the poles, north and south, are artificially enlarged in size. That's why Greenland appears so large. And that's always been hugely advantageous to the British Empire, because as you see here, so much of Canada is so close to the North Pole. So Canada appears to be very large here. Now the Mercator projection has another advantage uh, if, you're, if you're looking at things from from the empire's perspective. Uh, and that's illustrated by this wonderful map. This is again British from Bartholomew's 1890, the extent and distribution of the British Empire. Perhaps you've noticed something interesting about this map. Australia appears twice. So does New Zealand. So does India. What Bartholomew's has done here is simply uh, unwind a, a Mercator projection of the world, not to show you the world in 360 degrees, but to show you 490 degrees of the world. And therefore, an extra 130 degrees, about a third of the world appears twice. It happens to be the third of the world in which the British Empire appears. Um, artistically, this is actually a very attractive map. It has what artists would call a nice composition, uh, much more so than the classic uh, map that just shows a, a, a mere 360 degrees. So the Mercator projection, again, provides an advantage to those who seek uh, to exaggerate, even to a small extent, the extent and distribution of the empire. Now, before we leave this map, I'd like you to take a look at Canada and compare it to the continent of Africa. I think you can see on this map that Canada is at least as large as Africa, probably a little larger. Again, this is uh, what map makers call a projection. Artists call this perspective. What perspective do you have on what you're looking at? Suppose that you were a church organization or a relief organization seeking to raise funds 
for aid to Africa, you would not want to use a Mercator projection. You would want to use what's called an equal area projection. Here's one example. There are many kinds of equal area projections. Here is a, an equal area projection. And the first thing we notice immediately is that Canada isn't larger than Africa. Canada is not a third the size of Africa. So look, looking at the world from the perspective of that hypothetical relief organization, Oxfam, if you will, this is the kind of map uh, you would want to use to show the importance and the significance uh, of Africa. So while we're talking about perspective, well, what about the Australians? If you were an Australian, uh, you would be all, uh, all right with an equal area map. It certainly shows Australia in an appropriate relative size. But why is Australia always tucked away in the lower right-hand corner? It's almost like an afterthought. If you were an Australian, you'd rather look at the world from this perspective. <laughs> now, this is exactly the same map. It's simply oriented with south at the top and with Australia near the, near the center. So no reason why uh, Australians shouldn't have uh, their own perspective on the world. And while we're talking about um, perspective, suppose you were China. Suppose you were a rising power in the world, reaching out uh, militarily, politically, culturally, economically, trying to become the world's greatest power. Wouldn't you want to have a perspective on the world that reflected your own view? This is a map of the world first released to the public by the Chinese government in 2016. We know that the Chinese Academy of Sciences has been working on polyconic projections since the 1980s. This is a huge map. It's a wall map. It's over a meter high. And there's China right in the middle of the world. Uh, it's pretty close to an equal area map. You can see the size of Africa here. Um, that large white mass that you see to the south of China, that's the South Pole. Where's the United States? Well, it's, it's sort of scrunched in, squeezed in here just at the edge of the map, almost an afterthought. This map is published, there are reports that the first printing of this map was 40,000 copies. Um, and when I purchased my copy of this map, it arrived, I saw that it was from the 12th printing. One scholar has said, this is the visual representation of China's new global real politic. Now we've been talking about maps of the world, but we, while we're talking about perspective, we ought to talk for a second about bird's eye views. What happens when you look down on the globe from a point above? Uh, this is a Cold War map from the United States, 1950, looking down on the Soviet Union. And the, the, because the Earth is a sphere, when you look down on it, areas further away from the spot directly below you are artificially made smaller. Artists call this for shortening. In this case, we're looking down on the Soviet Union. You can see it's stretching out its tentacles in all directions toward Europe, toward Asia. Uh, but other parts of the globe further away are very small. And the United States is just these tiny little flags at the corner of the map, way far away. This, um, this notion that the bird's eye view artificially, again, inflates relative size, can be used the other way around. This is a map almost the same time, one year later, 1951, published by the Communist Party of France. Looking down on the globe from almost the same spot, in this case, it's used to exaggerate, to show the huge size of the Soviet Union and China, not because they're threatening the United States, but because they are being so widely threatened by the United States. Each of these arrows purports to represent some kind of a threat from the United States from missiles or planes or military bases around the world. And the subtitle is, who's the aggressor? Who's the menace? 
Again, they use the color black, but I want to focus your attention now on the arrow. The arrow is a very important symbol in persuasive cartography. Persuasive cartography uses a great variety of symbols. And the arrow is one that we don't typically find in traditional maps. Uh, often used to show a threat, a danger, an attack. Here's another example, again from the Cold War. 1948, the communist stage of coup in Czechoslovakia took over the government with aggressive help from the Soviet Union. Um, this is an Italian poster. The, the coup occurred just a few weeks before an Italian election. There was concern that the Italian Communist Party might gain legislative seats, and this poster was used to attack the Communist Party. It compares the coup d'etat in Czechoslovakia to the Nazi takeover in 1938. And the heart of the, of the poster is this map. And here's the map uh, uh, with these red arrows. It's almost the Soviet hand reaching in uh, with these, uh, each of these arrows being a finger. And uh, Finland, but particularly in Eastern Europe, each arrow shows a country dominated and driven into darkness, turned black by the Soviet threat. So the use of the arrow, uh, the use of dramatic symbols like this, uh, very different from traditional cartography where we see a small symbol representing a church or a cemetery or a schoolhouse. Here we see large dramatic symbols. Uh, and here's another example of a dramatic symbol. Uh, I wonder how many of our participants here uh, could instantly identify this country. It's Bulgaria. It's 1940, it's 1989. The Soviet Union has fallen and the people of Bulgaria believe that for the first time in 45 years, they have the opportunity for freedom, for a democratic government. The title of this map is 45 Years are enough, and there was a popular song at the same time. The map maker here has outlined the country with a barbed wire fence. And the title in the lower right hand corner tells us, this is a map of the communist concentration camps and prisons. Again, think of the selectivity of the artist. All of the detail has been stripped away, uh, except this barbed wire fence and the locations of the concentration camps and prisons. The map maker has discretion to decide how large or how small the symbols should be and what they should look like. By making them large and making them ominous, the symbols dominate the map. Symbols don't always have to be ominous. Here's, here's a, a map, the flags of a free empire. These are the emblems of British power throughout the world. 1910, the Children's Encyclopedia, Arthur Mee. And you'll notice that the size of these flags is such that the British Empire covers almost the entire world, except for South America and Russia. But I'm particularly interested in this portion highlighted here. If we take a close look, this is uh, the United States. What Mr. Mee has done is he's planted the British flag on British Honduras, Jamaica, and the Bahamas, all perfectly legitimate. But the length of the flagpole and the size of the flag uh, is so, are so great that the flags cover virtually all of the Eastern United States and a large part of Texas. So Mr. Arthur Mee has accomplished cartographically uh, what other, what British governments had previously uh, been unable to accomplish on two occasions, a military. So we've talked a lot now about symbols and colors. I want to talk a little about artistic style. Uh, the map people here are all familiar with maps of the Renaissance and the Enlightenment. Uh, and those maps are filled with artistic elements. There are uh, sea monsters and ships and wonderful things uh, filling the oceans. There are Baroque cartouches. But these are a decoration, if you will. They're ornamentation. They don't go to the artistic style of the map. 
Um, as we get into the 19th century particularly, there are occasions in which we see maps done in artistic styles intended to reflect the uh, audience, intended to attract people for whom the message uh, has been made. And a very good example is this allegorical map from 1825, the three roads to eternity. The top road is uh, people who are uh, extremely pious, they go directly to heaven. At the bottom, you have people who pay no attention to the word of God. They do terrible things like playing music, and they go directly to hell. In between, you have people who try to uh, do what they can. They think they're okay, but they're not really obeying the word of the Lord, and at the last minute, the devil brings them down to hell. Now, these, these maps were sold by peddlers, often on muleback in small towns and villages and farmhouses, door to door, they were intended for poor people, many of them illiterate. And this style, this folk art, primitive style, is exactly well suited to the audience for the map. And so what you have here is not just artistic decoration. It is at the heart of the artistic style of the map making itself. Here's an example uh, from the United States in the 19th century. This is a map of the White Mountains of New Hampshire. White Mountains are located north of Boston, and as the railroads were built out uh, into this area, they began to attract tourists, and, and homes were opened up to tourists, small hotels were open. Uh, these mountains are beautiful, they're rugged, there's wonderful hiking and scenery. It was a great tourist attraction. And there was a mountain guide named Franklin Levitt, who was unschooled, untutored, a rough-hewn sort of fellow. He decided he'd draw a map of the area. So he, he drew this map. Now, geographically, this map is sketchy at best. He put the mountains wherever he thought they looked best. Uh, my friend Michael Bueller, who has hiked extensively in the White Mountains, has said you would be ill-advised to set off trying to navigate these mountains based <laughs> on this map. But the heart of the map isn't the geography. It's this wonderful iconography here. Uh, this is Colonel Whipple and the moose on the left, and there's old Crawford killing a bear, and here's Tom Miller killing a bear with a knife. These are all legends from the White Mountains, some written, some oral, some perhaps true, some not. Uh, and Mr. Levitt thought if he put all this into a map, uh, he could sell some of these at these tourist uh, houses and perhaps get some business as a tourist guy. This map was a huge success and went through six editions over a period of 36 years. Uh, perfectly suited artistic style uh, for the audience. But the clearest example of all of artistic style comes uh, in, the, in the 20th century in the Art Deco movement, which was so widely accepted uh, in Europe. So here's a map, an Italian map from 1931. This is by an Italian government tourist agency. It's a brochure intended to attract French tourists to come to Italy. Uh, and if you open the brochure on one side, there's a huge amount of text, all in French, describing where you can go in Italy, anywhere from Sicily to the Veneto, in order to, to find the <laughs> finest wines and, and gourmet foods of Italy. And on the other side of the, of the brochure, when you open up, is this wonderful poster, very large. Uh, notice that there's no black in this poster. There's no red in this poster. This poster is predominantly in gold. It's the color of sunlight, it's the color of wealth, um, uh, and in blue, peaceful, restful blue. So this is an Italian example of Art Deco style 1931, here's a Spanish example. Uh, 1939, highlights of the victor, victory of General Francisco Franco in the Spanish Civil War. Uh, Art Deco style, uh, the only red on this map is in this set of insects at the lower right. And that red shows the course of action as Franco squeezed the uh, Republican forces down into a smaller and smaller area and eventually drove them into the sea. So that's from, from Spain. This is a very large poster from 1939. It's an English example 
um, the McDonald Go British example. Uh, this was from an Empire souvenir volume, glorifying the Empire, not one of Gill's better known maps, but one of my favorites. Again, no black on this map, no red. Golds and blues and greens. The final example is French. 1932, there was a disarmament conference in Geneva. Uh, the Germans were arguing for European disarmament with some help from the British. There was a group of center-right French politicians who had formed an organization to lobby the public and through them the government on a variety of subjects. But one of their efforts was to persuade the government uh, not to agree to disarmament. And they published, again, this very large poster, Art Deco style. And you notice the black is used here to show the threat from the Russians and the Germans and the Italians, and yes, from the British and the Americans, all of these armaments. Wonderful Art Deco style lettering. And the caption, of course, is sarcastic. And they want France disarmed, 1932. So four very different maps from four different countries, four different artists, all on four different subjects, all using the, the uh, acceptability of the Art Deco movement, the fact that people viewing this map would begin with an open mind toward the subject because Art Deco was at the time so popular. And the last subject I want to discuss is in many ways the most difficult. We in the United States have spent a lot of time <laughs> recently talking about fake news and the death of truth. And this is all about the 3D's cartographic data, distortion, and deception. Let's start with data. And this is a map uh, well known to our British friends as Emmanuel Bowen, a British map maker, 1747, a map of what's now the United States. And it shows. Uh, uh, most of this territory is part is Louisiana. It's French territory. And where are the English? The English colonies are here. They're cabined east of the Appalachians. So there we have Mr. Bowen in 1747. And this map appeared in Bowen's atlases as late as 1752. But in 1754, Mr. Bowen published another map of the British colonies just two years later. <clears throat> this is a very different map. Here we see the British colonies sweeping westward across the Mississippi. <clears throat> Virginia extends almost to the city of Chicago. The northern colonies sweep northward all the way to the edge of the map. What's changed? And that on the ground hasn't changed. Not much has changed, except we're on the eve of the French and Indian War. Uh, the British are sticking out their claims. Uh, to a territory in the Americas. Uh, Mr. Bowen was geographer to his majesty, and uh, this is an effort uh, for Mr. Bowen to make amends, perhaps, for his earlier map, but certainly it helps stake out the claims. What about the French? What was the French view? So this is July 1754, and here we have a French map published just a couple of months later. You see the date up here in the upper left, 1754. It's from a French map maker, Jean Pelleret, <laughs> published in the fall of 1754. We don't know exactly, September, October. And it's a map of North America. Let's take a closer look. And we see this is exactly what we would expect from a French map maker. The word Louisiane extends across the map from west to east. And just in case you missed it, the words Nouvelle France extend almost from the Gulf of Mexico to Hudson's Bay. And where are the British? They're the British, they're cabin east to the Appalachians. Uh, so very much what you would expect from a French map maker in the fall of 1754 on the eve of the war. But I haven't given you all the facts. Uh, Monsieur Palleret was French, but he wasn't living in France. He was an expatriate. He was living in London. And he had a day job. He was the tutor in French to the children of George II. So Monsieur Pelleret had a problem, and his problem became a lot worse in February of 1755 when the Mitchell map of North America was published. In London, it was an instant sensation, and it asserted the boldest possible claims uh, for English territory extending dramatically across the Mississippi all the way to the edge of the map. So what did Monsieur Pelleret do? 
Well, of course, he did the principal thing. He changed his map. Now, he kept the date the same. You notice in the cartouche, it still says 1754, but we know it was published in 1755 because it follows the Mitchell map. And there we have um, uh, the English territories extending exactly as shown on the Mitchell map. And in fact, the gold lines extend them all the way across the map to the Pacific. And what about French territory? Well, Louisiana is now pretty much confined to the city of New Orleans. So now we have four very different maps done by two map makers all in a very short period of time, just a period of a couple of years. One is reminded of the words of the British scholar Brian Harlan, who wrote, as much as guns and warships, maps have been the weapons of imperialism. So I want to turn now from the dramatic subject of international conflict and imperialism to the workaday subject of gold mines. This is Mr. Walter Knox. He wants to sell you stock in the Death Valley Exploration Company. You can buy it for a penny a share. It's about to be sold out. Gold is often found in regions of fearful heat. Well, Death Valley, uh, for those of you not intimately familiar with American geography, is located in the Mojave Desert of California. It is literally one of, if not the, hottest places on the face of the earth. Dry and arid as can be. But not to worry, says Mr. Knox, because water has recently been discovered in Death Valley. And Mr. Knox provides us a map to help us. And the map says that we've found a large stream of water running, a waterfall pouring over the rocks, green vegetation running along a canyon for half a mile. There it is on the map. And here it is so you can see it up close. Hellwinder Canyon, big water. So there's no problems in Death Valley. You should buy this stock for a penny a share. Well, there is in fact no Hellwinder Canyon in Death Valley. There is no big water in Death Valley. The law caught up with uh, Mr. Knox a little while later and prohibited him from selling stock to the public uh, in the Death Valley Exploration Company. At that point, the stock was available for only half a penny a share. Now, the last map I want to show you today is the most boring. This is a really boring promotional map published by Canadian National Railways in 1927. Um, in the 1920s, the, the Canadian National had built out a system of rail lines through the rugged Rocky Mountain Territory of Western Canada. These lines were mainly used for carrying uh, the products of logging and uh, mining, um, but they realized they could uh, do a tourist business. And so there was a wonderful lodge in a place called Jasper National Park here in British Columbia. And if we take a closer look, there it is, Jasper Park Lodge. It's got a golf course. There's a lake, there's swimming and boating, all sorts of water sports. There's hiking in the mountains, there's beautiful scenery. It's right on the rail line, you can see that in red. It's a perfect tourist destination. And so the railways combined it and they created something they called the Triangle Tour. The Triangle Tour uh, started in the southwestern corner of this map. You went to Vancouver, you got on a train, you went north and east to the lodge and you spent some time. Um, and then you took the train uh, west and north to uh, Prince Rupert, where you got on a ship and you sailed along the Pacific coast of, of Canada all the way back to Vancouver. It was a triangle and this brochure advertised uh, the tour. Again, a very boring tourist brochure. Unless, unless there happens to be anyone on this conference who is intimately familiar with the geography of Western Canada. Because if there is such a person here, that person may have recognized that the scale of the Western fifth of this map is dramatically smaller than the scale of the Eastern half. This map is drawn to two dramatically different scales. No indication on the map of either scale, no indication of where they change. In between, somebody has dropped in some generic Canadian Rockies topography, but this map is not at all what it appears to be. 
I asked the curator of the Leventhal Map Center at the Boston Public Library, Garrett Dash Nelson, if he had the technological capability of showing us somehow the distortion of this map. And he was able to do that. So this is what the map really looks like. <laughs> As you can see, uh, the Canadian National Railways has dramatically shriveled and folded the eastern portion of the map, particularly the southeastern portion of the map uh, in this area right here. Why would they do that? Why would they do that? Well, it turns out that Canadian National wasn't the only railroad in Canada. Uh, Canadian Pacific also had rail lines running through Western Canada. And Canadian Pacific had also hit upon the idea of using their rail lines to attract tourists to a resort. They had their own resort. It wasn't in Jasper National Park. It was to the southeast of Jasper National Park in Banff National Park. And so it was very important for Canadian National to avoid showing any part of their competitor's property. So this is the lower right-hand corner of the map. You can see here, that's the city of Banff. They desperately wanted to keep that from showing on their map, so they had to kind of fold back the map. And even when they did all the twisting and turning, it didn't completely work, so they had to sort of airbrush out a portion of the map. All designed to cover up your competitor's property. What did Canadian Pacific do about this? Uh, this is their map. About the same time, published two years later, um, and this is the, the map they used for their tourist attractions. Here's the area of their resort, and if we look closely, at the upper right-hand corner, you see that city of Banff. That's the city that was carefully omitted from the earlier map. And now if we look to the left, to the large circle, we see something called Chateau Lake Louise. This was the great resort. It was on a very well-known Canadian lake, quite large, Lake Louise. Same as the other water sports, boating, swimming, fishing, hiking in the mountains, and again, right on the rail line. So how did the Canadian Pacific address this problem? Well, the Canadian Pacific was a little, a little more sophisticated. Um, and we can see it in part here. You notice this compass road. I mentioned to you uh, that their resort uh, was to the southeast uh, of the Jasper National Park Resort. So what they did was they simply rotated their map to the southwest away, 45 degrees away from their competitor's property. And then they chopped the map off at the top. And that did away with most of any of uh, uh, what was in their way. But to the extent there was any of the property left, it was in the northwest corner of the map, the upper left corner of the map. And they just put a huge tidal block there. Tidal block doesn't need to be anywhere near that large, could have been half that size, could have been anywhere on the map. It's there to cover up their competitor's property. <laughs> so here we have two very different approaches taken at pretty much the same time by two competing commercial interests, each designed to persuade people to come to their property and ignore that of their competitors. Now, I run out of time in maps. I urge you to go to my website. Uh, the URL is here on the screen. Or you can just Google persuasive maps or my name, uh, and it should come up. I'm really happy and look forward to taking questions. And I'm told I should unshare my screen. So I'm going to do that right now.